hi everybody <clears throat> okay i'm hope you can see me i'm going to share my screen okay uh, first of all i want to say thank you very much for having me it's a real pleasure to be here today um i've sort of been for a couple of years now been uh, hoping to do a lecture for all of you i think the work that the wise day does is really amazing especially from the foundational side of making helping a lot of young people fall in love with uh, nature with the outdoors with the environment um and not just fall in love blindly but also in a very well educated way um so i i have never participated in events but i follow closely the events you all run and i i'm always very very impressed so um i'm glad that we finally kind of made it work so i want to thank hasi for actually reaching out this time and um asking me to come along and do a quick talk um i have to say i actually uh, had just this evening i got home at 7 pm i have spent 13 days cycling around sri lanka so i did cycled 1333 kilometers um, over 13 days to raise awareness for the 133 suicide prevention hotline um and i want to talk about it here because i do want to hope that you will help us to also raise awareness for that so obviously there's two things here but um it's uh, it, it can save a life if people know that that number exists and since i just got off my bike Uh, having done that ride i just thought i'd share that with you all uh, so if i look a little bit sunburnt and a little bit tired it's probably because of that it's a lot of miles but i'm very very happy that i could contribute to that as well so today i'm going to do this lecture i'm going to talk a little bit about marine mammals of sri lanka and some of the conservation work um i i have deliberately uh, left a few technical things um rather than my usual full storytelling because i i i realize you, you you guys do a lot of taxonomy and stuff which is actually really great and i wish more people were interested in that angle of things as well so i'm going to launch into that and talk a little bit uh, about sort of the taxonomy side just how they're broken up and why they're broken up into different groups and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the problems that they face i'll focus a little more on the blue whales but obviously give you examples uh, for the other species and then i will also um kind of talk a little bit about why protecting um the whales is a, a good idea and hopefully there'll be a little bit of time for questions as well and i look forward to hearing from all of you as well okay so we're going to uh, start um and so uh, here we go so this is basically if you think about marine mammals marine mammals there are three big groups okay so you have the cetaceans sirenians and the carnivores and uh if you um so cetaceans and i'll go deeper into that in a second because that's sort of my group of interest the cetaceans which are the odontocetes and mysticetes they divided up based on how they feed i'll talk about that in a second so just hold off sirenians are manatees and dugongs so we don't have manatees we do have dugongs here in sri lanka and carnivores so this might be the biggest surprise so if you think pinnipeds are things like seals sea lions i don't know if any of you got the chance to see the elephant seal that actually accidentally came to sri lanka um earlier this year um it was earlier this year i think um but uh, that was a very 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 rare sight it's never kind of been documented in our waters before and with good reason they have fur they've got a lot of blubber they belong in cooler waters so that animal obviously strayed here so apart from that we don't really have any other pinnipeds as we'd call them uh, sea otters we don't have sea otters in sri lanka so that's another group that um are belong to the carnivores and the biggest surprise might be the polar bears i don't know if any of you realize that polar bears i mean some of you might have but some of you might it might come as a shock uh to know that polar bears also are a kind of marine mammal and that's because they do spend some part of their life in the water they don't they actually spend more time on land but they do have sufficient time in the water in the ocean that makes them uh polar bears okay uh, sorry a marine mammals so if you think about marine mammals um you know um marine mammals like all mammals have you know hair and they feed uh, their young with milk um and you might think of a whale and you might think who has the hair right you're probably like mm, that's a little crazy that's not a furry animal but it is actually it's um, some of them have ha little hairs on their faces that get reabsorbed with uh, time uh but some others like if you think about like humpback whales for example uh they have these lumps on the fronts of their faces on the tops of their uh heads and those lumps are actually hair follicles uh so they do actually uh they're kind of 
typical mammals as we would think about them. So they fall into that description as well. Um, so let's talk a bit about marine mammals in Sri Lanka. What do we have out here? I mean, we're very, very blessed. Um, we haven't spent nearly enough time looking beyond our shoreline at what's out there, um, but we do have a lot of different species. And here I've broken it down. So let's start by looking at the cetaceans. So cetaceans are the collective term for whales and dolphins, basically. Um, and you can see that's very separate from sirenians, which are the dugongs. Okay, so let's look at the cetaceans. Cetaceans are typically divided into two groups based on how they feed. Okay, so you'll get the odontocetes, um, and these are just big words, don't worry about them, but basically odontocetes are the toothed whales. They have teeth in their mouth. Okay, so like you imagine, uh, so if you think about dolphins, they have teeth in their mouth, um, they use them to feed. The biggest odontocete or toothed whale is a sperm whale. Uh, sperm whales are really interesting because they only actually have teeth on the bottom jaw. They don't have teeth on the top jaw. And that's because they don't actually um, need to chew on their food. What they do is they eat squid. So they'll hunt their squid, they'll grab the squid. And so they need the teeth to grab onto it, but then they suck it down, right? So when they suck it down, obviously they don't need to like nom, 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 chew on it. So that's kind of an advantage. And so they only need a bottom row of teeth. Um, dolphins you'll see have both rows of teeth and that's usually because uh, they're feeding on things like fish that will catch them and they want to chew them and then swallow them down. So in Sri Lanka, we have 24 of the, about, I mean, and these numbers are a bit vague because we still have lots to discover, right? But we know we have about 24 species of Audanti seeds um, or uh, uh, out of 70 species that you'll find around the world. And then we move on to mysticetes, which is the middle column, as you can see in this uh, slide. And mysticetes are basically, again, don't worry about the word, mysticetes are baleen whales. So baleen whales, for those of you who don't know, and I'm simplifying because I um, imagine there's quite a diverse audience out here. I think there's quite a number of people in the room. So excuse me if you want to know some of this stuff. For those of you who don't, I hope this is, you know, I hope everyone gets something out of this talk. So misty seats are what we call baleen whales because they have long comb-like structures in their mouths that they use to fill to feed the water column. Okay, so they don't, bite. Um, so people will think about the blue whale and be like, it's so big. Aren't you afraid to work in, with them? Um, well, first of all, I don't get in the water with them, which is one thing. But also they just assume that because they are gigantic animals, these animals are going to bite and eat people. But what we do know is, interesting fun fact, is that these guys feed on tiny shrimp-like creatures, um, particularly the blue whales. Uh, some might feed on small fish and stuff like that, but really nothing uh, they need to chew on. So what they do is they'll open their mouths when they see like a, say, a swarm of uh, a shrimp, uh, like little prawns, iso or coon iso, uh, they'll find big groups and then they'll open their mouths and then they'll take a big gulp and they can actually extend. So they have on the bottom of their heads, on their like their bottom jaw, is actually very elastic. Uh, if you later on... If you, uh, Google lunge feeding humpback whales. You'll see these incredible shots of humpback whales coming out of the water and they'll have these massive, like big bulbous bits on the bottom. And that's basically extendable skin, so to speak. So it's like an accordion. They can, if they gulp a lot of water, that expands. So kind of like, I guess, like a pelican. And then when they, uh, they push out the water with their tongue and then that gets smaller and then they can swallow all the little things that are caught inside these fibers in their mouths, right? Daily. Um, so a fun fact about blue whales is that their esophagus or their throats are so small that they can, they would choke even on a loaf of bread, right? So if you think about a loaf of bread, it's about that size, not really very big, but they're so designed to feed on these tiny things that their esophagus is actually um, not designed to even feed on something as big, not very big, as a loaf of bread. Um, so that's, that I was thinking such an interesting point because our assumption is that if it's a big animal, it just, everything's big, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, they're very well adapted and designed to sort of, uh, live in the spaces and feed on the things that they're, uh, you know, best at hunting. Um, so in Sri Lanka, we have about four of 11 species. And again, these numbers are changeable because, you know, we do, um, you know, discover species all the time. Uh, well, not all the time, but uh, we do. There is potential for discovery, given that we have done little work in uh, our marine environment over the years. So, um, for example, uh, a few years ago, we uh, 
I mean, we discovered, and I say that, I say that pretty loosely because the, this, the, uh, this is a new species to our oceans, uh, the ocean around Sri Lanka or our coastline to see, so to say, uh, called the Omuras whale. And um, it was probably out there and we maybe just didn't realize it was out there all this time, uh, but that added another one to our list. So that was a very exciting and very characteristic markings, which made it easy to define. Um, but um, yeah, so I, what I want to say is, you know, the ocean is a mystery and it will continue to be a mystery uh, because it takes a lot of effort and work to get out there and do some of the uh, work and discovery work. And it can be quite expensive, but there is also room for discovery, which I think is kind of really exciting. And then we move on just briefly to the Cyrenians. Um, the Cyrenians are the dugongs. Um, and, you know, we have dugongs in Sri Lanka. Uh, they are often seen as bycatch in nets, uh, fishing nets. Uh, very rarely do we uh, hear of them being seen uh, alive, which is a bit sad. Um, but, uh, yeah, and um, for them, and I'll briefly talk about them here because I'm not really going to go into much detail on the dugongs, but they, the, you know, with the destruction of seagrass beds, that's their favorite food. So that's obviously, um, as they, they have lost food, their numbers have declined. Getting caught in nets as bycatch is obviously a big problem. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we have one of the four species that can be found globally. So just a, just a quick description about these different groups. Cyrenians, they evolved from elephants, which is cool. Uh, they're rather large, but they don't get as, as big as, say, um, the baleen whales, right? If you think about blue whale, but still big. They are stout-bodied. They have downturned snouts, rounded flippers, and a horizontal tail. And they swim with their fluke. So the fluke is the, uh, the tail, basically, of the animal. that we, we call that a fluke. Even in whales, we'll call that the tail fluke. They tend to be in shallow warm waters and coastal and riverine waters. Um, so here we see them, um, if you're lucky, uh, sort of in the Gulf of Manai area where there were extensive seagrass beds, uh, which aren't quite as extensive anymore. So they eat vegetarian, they're herbivores, right? Um, and uh, there was actually, this is a fun study. I mean, um, there were some researchers actually in, I think it was in Australia, who were trying to do some, they used to record the farts of a dugong. I know this is a ridiculous side point, but I just think it's so much fun. And they were trying to see if each individual had a different um, sound when they farted. So it's a bit of a fun fact for all of you. Um, they tend to bite off vegetation and chew so they, you know, herbivores they have to chew quite a lot because obviously the fiber and we are considering them marine because they actually never come to land right so they they live in the water throughout their lives so again we go back to the cetaceans uh you can see the odontocetes you can see very clearly here um this is the killer whale on the left hand side or orca kind of a kind of name because i think killer whale gives them feels like they get a bit of a bad reputation uh but they are the only well they're not really but they're the uh, best known marine mammal uh, feeders and uh, as a not, I mean, I, I'm going to keep dropping side notes because I just think sometimes there's some fun facts that will uh, make you think um, a little deeply, more deeply about a, a species or something. So with, in terms of killer whales, we think about them as all being these like, you know, killer whales that go out and eat marine mammals. But actually very interestingly, uh, they've been really uh, extensively studied of the west coast of Canada um, in uh, for off British Columbia. And actually what they found there was that there's um, largely two groups living in the same area, but feeding very differently. Okay, so you have what you call the residents and the transient killer whales. The resident killer whales are the ones that um, feed on fish, um, and so they're not what you think about as killer whales in the sense that they're not hunting marine mammals. And then you have the transients, which are marine mammal hunters. Um, so they both live in the same habitat, but they're distinguished by what they feed on. But what's really fun is that um, the residents, because they eat fish, they tend to be quite vocal because fish aren't hearing in the same um, hearing range as the as, uh, as the killer whale itself or the orca. And so therefore the orca can be really noisy when it's going on hunting for fish. But with the transients, um, they have to, they basically have to um, 
be very quiet and stealthy when they're hunting because their prey, which is things like seals, can actually hear in the same frequency range as them. So they tend to be the quieter of the two groups that live in the same place. So I thought that was really, I think that's always such a fun fact to share. And then you have the other group, which is the misty seeds or the baleen whales. Like I said, you can see in their mouth, you can see these comb-like structures in their mouth. So um, just filter feeding the water column. And uh, a, a fun fact about that is uh, baleen whales will often have different lengths of baleen and different colors of baleen, depending on the species. So with blue whales, they tend to have very short two foot black baleen in their mouth. Um, but if you think about uh, the bowhead whale, which lives up in the Arctic Circle, they tend to have um, really, they have the longest baleen. It can go up, grow up to about 10 feet long. Okay. It's like, it's actually called the mustached whale um, as just like a fun way of referring to them because it looks like a big furry mustache in their mouths. Okay. And their um, baleen tends to be more like an ivory color. So, and some, some of them will have half a mouth of black and half a mouth of white baleen. So super fun. Definitely look that up. Um, I think that's, it's so neat that, that you can, if you find baleen washed up on a beach, potentially you can actually identify who it came from based on just the coloration and length and stuff like that. So there's a lot of text on this, but just listen to me and don't worry about the text. Um, it's here. So I won't didn't forget anything, but both, um, Cetaceans in general evolved from ungulates. So uh, their closest extant relative is the hippopotamus, which I guess if you think about it, kind of makes sense. Um, so that's kind of cool. But you can see the baleen whales or the misty seeds tend to be much bigger in body size than um, the odontic seeds or the toothed whales. Sperm whales are uh, somewhat smaller than say things like humpbacks or uh, fin whales and blue whales. Um, they all are streamlined and they have horizontal flukes. So that's your key difference between, say, fish or sharks and whales and dolphins. So obviously, when you think about a shark, when it swims, it swims like that's what its tail does. Whereas with uh, whales, they tend to swim like this, right? So the, their flukes or their tails are differently um, connected to their bodies. Um, so the key difference here between the odontocetes or the tooth whales and the misty seeds, apart from the structures that they use to actually feed is how many blowholes they have. So with um, tooth whales, they have one blowhole. So if you think about pictures of which you may have seen of dolphins, of killer whales, they have one blowhole on the top of their heads. That's basically their nostril that has shifted to the top of their heads over the evolutionary time because that's the first part of their body to come out of the water. And as air breathing mammals, they have to come out and they breathe at the surface. So they aren't fish, they can't actually breathe underwater. Um, so they tend to have, um, and, and with sperm whales, which like I said are the biggest odontocetes or tooth whales, they have one blowhole. But what's really fun about them is they have these weird square head shaped heads, if you've ever seen one of them. And their blowhole is on the left hand side of the head. So actually, when we're out at sea, um, if you see a uh, exhalation or blow or a spout going off to the left hand side i mean if conditions are good right it's not too windy um we actually can identify that as a sperm whale straight away so i think that's really neat uh, whereas with misty seats or baleen whales they tend to have two blow holes and in fact if you look at a aerial photograph of a blue whale it looks like a big upside down nose so it's uh, sort of really cool to see um they, you know, various things, they kind of feed on similar things. They have different feeding techniques. So tooth whales will echolocate. It's kind of like bats. Uh, so your dolphins will kind of make these dolphins and sperm whales and all, they'll click and listen for the uh, return click to uh, locate where their food is, which is really neat, right? I mean, I think even bats are awesome. You think that it could be a moving object, it can be a tiny object, and they can still so accurately um, basically locate these prey species. So that's really interesting. Um, and with uh, tooth whales, they tend to sort of uh, sieve through the water column and gulp and things like that, like I mentioned. Uh, they're both marine because they basically generally like live um, in the water. Some actually, some uh, dolphins or killer whales actually in some places in Patagonia, for example, you get killer whales, they'll beach themselves. I, that means they'll actually swim onto the beach to catch 
their prey and then they'll slither back into the ocean. So we kind of have these moments when they might be out of water, but that's a very specialized feeding technique only in that population. So in general, they tend to be also in the ocean. Okay, so we're going to move on now a little bit to talk. Uh, I'll talk specifically about bluebells, but I'll bring in facts about some of the other species as we go through. Um, so yeah, so as some of you may know, uh, the bluebells are kind of the species I've spent most time working on here around our waters. Um, I, we also do work on sperm whales, on Amuraz whales, Bridie's whales, um, and various dolphin populations. But uh, uh, you know, extensive work has been done on the blue whales. So I'll talk a little bit about that kind of work that we've done. Um, in uh, the in the sixties, there was illegal Soviet whaling, uh, which meant there were Soviet whaling ships going to Antarctica. And they would, they stopped off in the waters around Sri Lanka, the Northern Indian Ocean, and they realized that there were blue whales here as well. So they decided to hunt them. And they basically over four years, and that's, we call them four seasons, and which amounts to something less than two months because they're just bypassing, right? They were just bypassing and they would see these whales and be like, oh, we might as well just catch some here. Hunt them, put them, you know, process them on the vessel and keep moving to Antarctica. Um, they took out 1,294 animals, which is actually quite a huge number if you think about it, um, over a very short period of time. Uh, the reason they stopped is actually not because they were tired of catching them, but they actually realized that um, it was commercially unviable. So by that, I mean, in the early, you know, in the second and third seasons when they came, um, actually in the second season they took out something like 900 individuals because they were kind of all over and they didn't have to work hard to actually catch these but then in the third and the fourth season their numbers declined and that's because they had to work a lot harder so they were expending more um, energy in terms of fuel cost, uh, fuel etc and uh, to catch this low number of whales and so then they decided you know what it doesn't make us make any sense economically uh, we're not going to hunt for whales in these waters so we don't really fully understand the damage that's been done but we certainly are trying our best to use photo identification methods to try to come up with population estimates to understand um, how these populations have been impacted over time so the kinds of threats that we see out here uh, are varied we this is an individual that was photographed in um, I think it was like 2003, I can't remember, but um, you can see here that this animal has a, a, a net. It's wrapped around its tail fluke. So this is a great picture of a tail fluke. Not so great because it's actually um, entangled. And you can see it's wrapped around this. It was wrapped along the sides of the body and went, the rope went through its mouth. The animal was incredibly skinny. And what, what happens when they get entangled is it could be one of two things. Um, one thing is that they can uh, basically, um, if if they get entangled underwater, uh, they can drown because, like I said, they have to come up to the surface to breathe. But if they are entangled at the uh, surface, and if there's something buoyant like a like some flotation device at the surface, then these whales can't dive to feed. And if they can't feed, obviously they, die, they can die of starvation. So entanglement is not a great thing. And actually um, the North Atlantic right whale population of the East coast of the US is currently critically endangered and purely because of this. They get caught in what we call lobster pots. So in the, on the East coast of the US, they're really famous for lobster. Okay, that's like their big thing, the main lobster. And how they catch it is they have like a, a, a little cage um, and um, um, then it has a rope and at the top there's a buoyant, buoyant like a buoy right so it floats at the surface so that the fishermen know where they've dropped their lobster pots and these North Atlantic right whales um, go through these areas and they get very entangled and then that one thing is they can also be dragging about the same as their body weight in net and, and these cages. And that's really tiring. So imagine carrying someone your exact same way on your back and having to walk around all day, right? That's really tiring. You're burning a lot of energy and calories and you may not be able to feed enough to kind of fulfill your body's needs. So they're finding that actually a lot of animals get entangled. A lot of them have been dying. They also get hit by ships. I'll talk a bit about ship strike in a second, but those are the two key problems for this population. And, you know, the sad part is, you know, we often think 
um, that, um, and I know this audience is very varied and that's what's really cool. I know, I think I saw Mindis out here who does amazing work, right? With animals that maybe lots of people don't pay much attention to. I'm sure there's loads of people out there. You guys pay so much attention to the little things out there as well. And we often like to think that, uh, you know, human beings care about the large animals, right? Uh, oh yeah, people care about whales and elephants and tigers and um, leopards and stuff. And sure, there's a lot of focus on them, but I think this is a great example of how much people maybe don't even care, right? Like if we can allow a large whale species that, you know, people apparently are more attracted to go to extinction in our lifetimes, um, the scary part about that is then what hope do we have for the small species, the more, um, the more cryptic species, uh, that of many of which we know very little about, right? So I think that's something really important for us to also keep in mind. Uh, we have to work for everything in the oceans. Um, and, and I do focus on whales uh, primarily because I kind of fell into this role in some ways with um, a chance encounter with these blue whales many, many years ago. But I do believe in the conservation of the whole ecosystem, every component, including the people whose livelihoods depend on it. So that's something uh, to keep in mind. Um, okay, let's try to get the next slide. Okay, uh, another thing that we see is, so um, with the entanglement, if an animal gets entangled, there is a chance that it will die, right? So that can be a population level threat. It can like reduce the numbers in the population. I've got a picture here of whale watching boats and whale watching boats have a different kind of impact. Uh, one actually, okay, so it's more harassment, right? So I'm sure, you know, many of you have gone to Yala, you've seen all the vehicles like horning and trying to get in front and trying to see the leopard. And uh, Here, it's sort of the same thing, right? We see boats and they'll race behind um, a whale and then they'll wait for it. When, once it dives, they'll all wait. And then the minute the whale comes up, all these vessels would start moving to it. Um, and the thing with whale watching is that whale watching is a very new industry, right? In, now in our lifetimes, we talk about it like it's something that's been around a long time, but it only started in the 1990s. And so we don't fully understand what the long-term impact is of, the, of this constant interaction of vessels with um, these whales and in, in this habitat. So um, that's something for us to think about as well. While it's obviously uh, a way to earn tourism dollars and Sri Lanka is very dependent on tourism and a lot of livelihoods depend on it. I think it's important for us to think about how we do it. So from, at Oceanswell, actually, that's one of the things we are focusing on is looking at um, how to create a slightly more sustainable whale watching industry. And for that, we, we use drones. We try to, we've tried to film sort of interactions, look at how the boats and the, are interacting with the whales. Uh, we do research on um, so, so the whales, they come up to breathe and they'll breathe a few times, they'll exhale a few times and then they'll dive, right? They'll do their last big dive and go down to the depths to feed. And so we count how many times they come up to the surface, whether that changes when there's a lot of boats coming towards them, whether their dive cycles are shorter. So these are things, indicators for us um, to see whether or not there's a certain level of harassment. And we... One of the other things we want to do is also to look at um, uh, stress hormones, uh, if we can. And um, of course, it's a bit tricky because we kind of have to wait for the whales to poop, right? And, uh, you know, it's opportunistic. So, um, but if we do find samples, the idea is that we collect it and then can do some uh, stress hormone work. Um, and, and related to this, and let me just show you, actually, here's a, so just so you can see. Well, you can't actually. Okay, well, this video is actually of um, a, a, a whale being followed by these uh, boats that I took um, from a, a plane, but uh, you can't see the video right now, unfortunately. But anyway, uh, just to tell you that, okay, so on top of that, like if we think about vessels, we think about, okay, this harassment at the surface, right? Like a very visual harassment. But one of the other things that we don't really think about is acoustic pollution, right? Sound pollution. Look, these are animals that see their world through their ears, right? Like their eyesight isn't generally very good because, you know, you can't see much in underwater, but they are very dependent on sound production. They are very dependent on, uh, hearing uh, to basically um, to navigate through their world, to find their food, to find their mates, to find their friends, to find their families, right? 
And so as we have more and more activity in the oceans, you can imagine sound um, is increased and that can be detrimental to their lives in many ways. And, and as a good example, I, you know, just to tell you how um, stressed these animals can get, um, this is a really great, I mean, I think it's such a great example of science kind of telling us a very interesting story. Um, it, on the east coast of the US with the North Atlantic right whales, they've been collecting feces or whale poop for a very long time. Um, and they were collecting samples from before 9-11. So we actually, funny enough, tomorrow is 9-11, 2020 though. But uh, before sort of the, um, the attacks in the US, the Twin Tower attacks. So they were collecting samples before 9-11. They were collected samples during, as soon as 9-11 happened in the kind of the week that followed. And then they continued to collect fecal samples or whale poop samples after that. And um, when they did an analysis, what they found, and this is, this is the hard part about Zoom is that I'm sort of kind of talking to myself. I can't really uh, see the interaction, but I, I'm hoping that some people will find this interesting is that um, uh, when they tested these samples, they found that the steroid levels or the cortical, sorry, the cortical steroids or the stress hormone levels were uh, lowest in the week after 9-11, right? And, and that obviously for like humans, it's a bit confusing because the whole world was so stressed out, right? People were really stressed out when that attack happened. But for whales, it was like some of them, one of the most relaxing times in their lives, right? And what the researchers found was that um, as soon as 9-11 happened, they actually shut down shipping in the Bay of Fundy, which is on the East Coast of the US, which means noise levels dropped and when the noise levels dropped the whales were not so stressed anymore right and that's a great reminder of how um noise is a re has a really big impact on these animals that use their hearing and are so dependent on it as they move through their ecosystems and their spaces right um so uh, and 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 their stress levels Basically, their cortical or their stress hormones increased as soon as the shipping started again, and there was they had high stress levels before 9/11, right? Because that's the shipping was normal. When the shipping dropped, their stress levels dropped, and then when the shipping started, the stress levels went up. So uh, that's a really interesting thing. We are hoping to do a bit more work on uh, stress hormones in our collection of um, whale poop as well out here. But we're, we uh, are building collaborations to help us learn from those researchers out at the New England Aquarium uh, to bring some of their skill and knowledge here as well. Okay, so then one of the big problems that I've been working with for a very long time is this problem of ship strikes. So this is a very typical scene out on our oceans. That's a blue, beautiful blue whale diving. In the background, you see a big ship, right? In case anyone's wondering, sometimes I get this question, so I'm gonna just throw it out there. Uh, <clears throat> what you can see attached to the tail fluke are remoras. So if you don't, Many of you might know what remoras are, but for those of you who don't, there are these really cool fish that hitchhike on whales and sharks and things like that. They very interestingly, quite a lot of people think they attach themselves from the mouth, but they don't. They actually attach from these molecular plates on the backs of their heads, which is really clever because that means when the whale dives, right, they are attached like this. And what they do is they can then just like feed the excess food that the whale doesn't get in their mouth um, and um, swallow it. So they get a free ride, they get free food, uh, but they have to be super well adapted to dive and go down to these crazy depths that their host species is taking them down to, right? So um, pretty neat, I think. But yes, so this is a typical scene. And um, so we'll just talk a little more about this problem because again, this is something I've spent a fair bit of time thinking about and trying to work on. So this is a map of uh, uh, shipping lanes in the world and lots of lines, but don't panic. Uh, let's look at the yellow lines. The yellow lines are the areas where there's like busier shipping highways, right? Like busy, busy, busy ones. And if you look at, you know, our waters around Sri Lanka, oops, that circle has shifted. It's not supposed to be there, by the way. It's meant to be around Sri Lanka. You can see some of the busiest shipping highways in the world are actually at our doorstep. So the south coast of Sri Lanka is the main artery through the Indian Ocean. Everything from Singapore to Dubai goes through this area. Uh, while shipping has... Um, uh, doubled globally since the 70s in the waters around our Sri Lanka, the northern Indian Ocean. It has quadrupled because trade is changing. There's a lot more activity in our waters. 
Um, so, so I mean, it's also just, you know, if you think about it, like having a lot of ships in the water, it's acoustic pollution, but there are also other opportunities for um, impacts. Um, so, um, just this is zoomed in view so you guys can see a little bit more like kind of what sort of data we will use in a situation like this. You can see on the south coast of Sri Lanka, there's like a big black blob. Those are just sightings of whales that we've collected over the years. You'll see a few more sightings in other places. And then you see the red lines. The red lines are real ship, ship traffic data. So you can use, you can get, um, it's very expensive to get it, but you can get data called AIS, which is automated information systems. So every ship over a certain size and weight has to have this device on it that uh, basically gives, um, uh, sends off a signal about its location. And so there are, um, uh, this is great. Thank you. Whoever's putting the pointers out there, I really appreciate it, by the way. I'm, at first, I was like very, I, I thought I'd done that, but I'm, I'm not doing it. So thank you. But um, so this data, this satellite data tells us where the ships are going. And what we can see here is that the red lines are like the most popular shipping routes, right? We have designated shipping highways. And so you can see lots of where, uh, ships going through a certain area. There's overlap between ships and whales off the southern coast of Sri Lanka. So obviously sites like this are not unusual. Some of you may have already seen this image. Um, I use it a fair bit because I want people to realize that even the biggest animal that has ever roamed the planet is not necessarily safe in its own home um, as a result of um, human, uh, human creation, right? Which is also quite something to think about. And so this is a blue whale that came into our main harbor in uh, main port in Colombo in 2012. Uh, you can see that it was killed on impact. And that's why we can see internal hemorrhaging. Um, this vessel actually, we tracked some of the, we looked at some of their movement data and we discovered that it was traveling at uh, over 20 knots, uh, which is really quite fast for a ship. Um, and this is not an isolated incident. About 10 days after, 12 days after, we found another carcass floating at sea with a massive gash on its tail, which was uh, indicative of a propeller gash. So hit by a propeller of a ship. And so that was um, obviously, uh, oops, sorry. That was evidence that this was happening. Now, the tricky thing with this is, well, the tricky thing with the ocean in general is that it's a pretty elusive, it's a vast space um, that leaves us very few clues in anything we do, right? So oftentimes these carcasses, they're neutrally buoyant, uh, they're negatively buoyant, which means they tend to sink, right? Blue whales tend to sink. So quite often if they get hit or something like that happens, there's a higher chance that they're going to sink and we're not going to have evidence of that happening, okay? Um, Sometimes they, you have dead carcasses washing up onto the beach, uh, but because of our tropical humid conditions, they deteriorate really fast. So this carcass, for example, uh, happened to, they took it out to sea, but then it washed up on our beach in the Hivala. And we, it was three days later, it was so deteriorated, we actually thought it was a different whale until we saw the same rope that was used to tow it out in the first place was still on that carcass. So that was how we identified the same individual, but it was so deteriorated, right? So it's a very quick process. And so evidence like this is not always available, which is oftentimes the pushback that you'll get um, when we're trying to work on this problem. It's like there's a lot of people who say, so how many whales are getting killed, right? And I don't, it's very hard for us to know. I think we just have to work on the precautionary principle. And as shipping ships increase in the important habitats of these whales, we have to know that this is going to happen more and more. Off California, where this is a problem, and they've extensively studied the problem, they find that for every whale that gets documented dead like this, there's at least 10 others that go undocumented. So that's quite a few animals. Um, so even if we saw two in a year, that's say roughly 20 animals that have potentially died uh, because of you know, uh, anthropogenic impacts, human impacts. So it's something for us to think about a little bit. Um, so it is, it's, ship strike is a problem. Uh, it is the biggest problem for our whales because uh, um, if one gets hit, it dies. And so that's definitely going to reduce the number in our population. We still don't know how many we have, which is something we're trying to figure out. So if we, our population was decimated by the Soviet whaling that I talked about. And so th this is just a numbers game, right? So it's really important for us to consider these problems and look at, and the thing is, you know, all of you probably do know that conservation is 
complex, right? Where there's so many elements to trying to resolve a conservation problem quite often. Um, whereas this we find is, is kind of a simple problem to solve because if we can see where the whales and ships overlap and if we can separate those spaces, there's a good chance we're going to have a positive impact. We're not going to necessarily save every single whale, but we're probably going to have a reduction in the number of whales that we can are die, right? Which is no one's complaining about that. Um, but, you know, as we address these problems, it's also very important for us to look at not just a single species, but look at everything that, you know, is impacted and how we can change impacts on that. So some of the work that we've done over the years has shown that actually by shifting the shipping lanes on the south coast of Sri Lanka, like 20 nautical miles, which is say, you know, I'm just going to say 22 to 25 kilometers offshore, which is not very much, um, or th up to 30, I guess, um, we can actually reduce the problem of ship strike by about 80%. So there's been a number of different studies that we put together in a report to show that. And so that's really great, right? Um, but there are other wins as well. It's not just about saving the whales, right? Um, here's a picture. You can see there's a ship in the middle. There's a whale watching boat, tiny whale watching boat, and there's a blue whale. So this is kind of very typical in Sri Lanka where these whale watching boats are also moving in these shipping highways. And by shifting the shipping highway a little bit further offshore, we're also kind of creating a space of sa safer space for our whale watching industry. Um, the a large number of our fishing fleet is also artisanal. They tend to stay in nearshore waters, um, in coastal waters. And again, they also are at risk in these shipping lanes. Um, and then uh, also the further away from the coast that ships are, you get less pollution from those ships to coastal populations. And in other countries, they've found that actually things like um, there's been a reduction in, say, people on the coastline having things like asthma, um, uh, basically by sh shifting the shipping lanes because the air is a bit cleaner, right? So, you know, it seems like a, uh, it's like you make, it makes you wonder why this hasn't been done. And, and I make it sound a lot simpler than it is in terms of how we resolve it. So the Sri Lankan government has to write a report and that has to go to the International Maritime Organization who has to approve these changes. What I can tell you is that we have had meetings with the World Shipping Council and the, that manages some of the biggest ships in the world, um, shipping fleets and the and International Maritime Organization. And we've, they have been very positive about this change on many fronts. Um, in fact, 23% of vessels, shipping ships, have started to voluntarily move further offshore so that they can avoid interaction with whales, which is one thing. But the other thing is they find that our Sri Lankan waters can be a little dangerous because of a lot of our small shipping uh, small fishing boats tend to bob around in the ocean. You think about some of the small boats that we have out there. Um, they don't necessarily have lights on. They have no tracking device. So ships can't actually uh, see where they are in the ocean. They can't be detected by ship radar. So it's actually um, quite dangerous. We don't necessarily hear about boats getting hit by ships as often as it happens. Um, so, so we can create a safer, safer space by addressing this problem that we've been looking at in terms of these blue whales. And that just brings me on to the final thing, which I think is very relevant right now. It's this uh, basically oil spills and oil-based pollution. So we all know what's going on right now. The uh, MV Diamond that caught fire uh, off Sangaban Kanda Point. Uh, it was 38 nautical miles offshore. They managed to douse the flames, take it a bit further offshore. And uh, then um, they, it re sort of, there was a spark that reignited. Um, the thing is, there is a, apparently, uh, and I, I'm gathering this from the news as well. So um, it's... Uh, I mean, there might be other pieces of information coming out, but there was some oil leakage. Uh, the issue for us with oil spills, I mean, it's, it's a devastating problem. It can smother reefs. It can end up washing up in our sand, um, can't clean all the sand. So that means the oil will persist. But with marine mammals, one thing is that they tend to move. So if it's in a contained area, there is a chance that these marine mammals will be able to move out of the area unless it's a very critical habitat for them. Um, they also, um, so the biggest thing would be as they have to come up to breathe, if there's an oil slick, if there's a layer of oil, they will obviously inhale that. That can be problematic. 
Uh, they, it can also irritate things like their mucous membranes, so their eyes, their mouths. So those are problems. And the blowhole, obviously sensitive skin, so that can be also a problem. So they uh, can face a lot of issues as a result of this. Uh, if a big oil spill would happen, but there's all kinds of other marine disasters that will happen in that instance. Uh, so yeah, uh, we do have to uh, keep our fingers crossed uh, that um, it doesn't get worse than it is right now. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up now with the last bit of my talk, you'll be happy to know, uh, where I'm going to talk a little bit very briefly about why we should protect these animals in the oceans. I'm sure all of you have a species that you work with or are fascinated by and you understand what an important role they play in the ecosystem that they're, they're found in. Um, so whales, and I'm going to focus on the whales because hey, that's my thing. Uh, whales are what we call ecosystem engineers. Their presence in the environment um, ensures the proper functioning of that environment, right? So if you take all the whales out, it's going to disrupt everything, right? So in general, everything's in that place for a reason. And we, I think we all know that. All of you are obviously really keen um, nature lovers um, and enthusiasts about the outdoors. So sometimes telling people like you is uh, it's super easy because you already know. Um, so um, you understand these concepts. But just to tell you how are whales ecosystem engineers well here's a fantastic photograph taken by one of my friends it's a pot of sperm whales and you can see that lovely um, brown substance is whale poop right um, something I'm very well known for is my love for whale poop and I haven't got, gone into that much detail this time but here you go picture of whales pooping why is it important why does what does that have to do with whales and ecosystem engineering well one of the things is whales will dive to the depths to feed and and they feed in areas where there are nutrients that you don't necessarily get in the surface waters. So nutrients like iron or nitrogen, which is in limiting supply at the surface of our oceans. So then they'll feed on whatever they're feeding on. They'll take in just some of these iron, uh, nitrogen, nutrients, and then they'll come up to the surface to breathe as they have to. And then they'll um, basically release these large fecal plumes, right? Like big, basically pools. And this is the ocean's fertilizer, right? So they're releasing these nutrients into these surface waters. These nutrients um, then are used by the tiny uh, microscopic plants, the phytoplankton that are all over the surface of our oceans. They, you know, photosynthesize. So they use these nutrients, they use sunlight, they eat that for breakfast, and then they produce oxygen. Um, 50 to 70% of the oxygen that we breathe is actually produced by plants in the ocean so actually it they, the ocean is really integral to our survival uh, sometimes we don't think about it and sometimes some of the oxygen that we breathe has come as a result of the whales fertilizing these plants that in gen then in turn give us oxygen so i think that's always a really fun thing to think about this process of these whales going down diving feeding coming up releasing nutrients is called a whale pump um, and then the last way that they also provide a very big service to the ecosystem is that they um, are food, right? Like here at the surface, there's lots of species that might feed on them. Um, and then as a carcass sinks, uh, it's what we call whale fall. That's actually the technical term for a whale carcass that sinks to the bottom of the seafloor. It provides food to other species deep at the depths of the ocean, some parts of the ocean, but there's not a lot of food. Um, and that the species are obviously very well adapted to living long periods of time without food, but of course they do need something. So when these carcasses drop from the surface waters, thousands of meters deep, they provide a feast to a lot of different species. Also in these bodies of these carcasses, they trap excess carbon um, and they take it down to the depths of the ocean. The ocean is our greatest carbon sink basically it holds on to ex excess carbon from the atmosphere, um, which is actually a huge service to us. And it actually buffers um, some of the impacts of um, climate change as 
the result. So the ocean is really important. These whales are really important. Generally, species are where they are because they need to be there because they serve a purpose. Um, so with that, I want to just wrap up. I think that's my time allocation. Um, I am looking forward to some questions maybe, um, but to, to continue following the work that we do, do come follow us on oceanswell.org. Um, and check out some of the stuff. We've got lots of really interesting projects. This is just a component of what we do, but we do marine conservation research on a number of species. We also do a lot of uh, education-related work, online courses, field courses. Um, we run discussion groups. If, you, um, if you're young and in the audience and you want to learn more about the oceans, do join us for what we call our Ocean Hero Huddle, which is um, a half-hour session where you watch a video and you join in and you have a discussion about some amazing species. So last month, my team conducted a talk about uh, tongue-eating isopods that live on fish, which is really cool. They feed on the tongue of a fish and they replace the tongue, actually, these isopods. I think that's really awesome. Um, and then we have the, the more grown-up version, which is our marine conservation conversations, which are one hour long. And they are focused around a scientific journal article, but I, you know it's open to everyone. So we have people from all the different backgrounds coming in. I always ensure we pick up a paper that's super interesting. Um, we've talked about a lot of marine conservation to topics in the last 21 um, MCCs. I look forward to seeing some of you at our, all our next events. So do keep following at Oceansville.org.